fireflies. We had very few fly fireflies out at our place in the country this summer. Do you guys have, anybody have seen an abundance of fireflies? Yeah. Oh, good. That, that's encouraging because it means that they're, they're patchy, but in some areas they're doing well, in other areas not so well. So, but the key thing to keep in mind is that most species, when people talk about extinctions, and when they're talking about mass extinctions, in many cases they're talking about relatively small and inconspicuous species you may not even be aware are in existence. Okay, so how do we assess threats? This is where, where sort of my subtitle of my talk comes from. Climate change impacts the environment and changes the selective regime that organisms are experiencing. So that species and ecological communities face uh, major changes in their environment. This is not a uh, example of a climate change. This is the Three Gorges Dam in China, which is, to me, one of the major events. And so what, quite often it becomes difficult to, to tease out the effects of other sorts of things as well as climate change when you're looking at changes in, in communities or possible extinctions. But there are a number of threats that are more direct to species persistence than climate change will be. The major one is probably habitat loss, which occurs as humans develop or clear out particular environments. Another major one is the use of pesticides and herbicides, which people suspect may be one of the factors involved in this decline in insects that are occurring worldwide. Uh, you can have overhunting or overfishing of a particular species, which can lead to extinctions in certainly on, on a local population basis. And some organisms really lack uh, much of a genetic diversity, so they're not able to respond very well to a change in the environment, which means that they can't evolve rapidly enough. Now, what we're trying to find is how many of these species actually are out there and what sort of uh, thing may be going on, because we're starting to find that there are a number of species that actually are responding remarkably quickly to climate change. And one of the things that we need to get past is this old Darwinian idea of that uh, selection is very slow and that evolution cannot be observed during the lifetimes of human beings. It turns out it can be, especially when you're looking at relatively small organisms. Things like, one of, one of the classic examples of, of rapid evolution is uh, resistance to antibiotics by bacteria that we're all probably somewhat concerned about. Uh, re, uh, the ability to react or to, to evolve resistance to pesticides is very common in a lot of insects. And one of the reasons that both pesticides and antibiotics and the industry supporting them have to constantly be going because Everything that was used probably 20 years ago, most of the organisms it was designed to eliminate are resistant to it and no longer, you know, they, to them it's just another annoying aspect of their environment. All right, look at a few examples here. Okay, elephants, rhinoceros, and tigers are all endangered, but not because of climate change but because of a combination of habitat loss and overhunting in their, in their situations, especially for their horns with rhinoceroses and with their tusks for elephants. Uh, the irony is, is that some of these Indian elephants or the Asiatic elephants have basically given up on having tusks now. They, they no longer, they, there's been such, such strong selection against elephants with big tusks that a lot of the elephants born nowadays never develop tusks. So they, they figured us out. It, it's kind of a, a harsh way of doing it, but it, it's become a big issue. Plants, now animals can move. This is a key thing. Animals can move in their environment. And uh, basically, if, if, the, if one part of the environment is becoming uh, un, un, sufficiently unpleasant for them that they can no longer survive or reproduce in those areas, they will try to find other areas where they can. All, all animals do this. Whether we're talking about insects, whether you're talking about fish in the ocean, whether you're talking about mammals. In fact, mammals move around very easily, but since mammals are usually faced with things like overhunting or habitat loss, as long as there's adequate habitat and nobody's killing them, they can, they can probably make it. Plants, on the other hand, show the impacts of climate change to a much greater degree because they can't move. Plants have to disperse, but, but a plant can't move. 
to a more favorable habitat, and they can be exposed to either to, uh, changes in temperature or what seems to be more important in a lot of the situations is that new pest species are moving in, like the bark beetles in the uh, Rocky Mountains that are a species that used to die every winter during the cold, and now that the, the mountains are, and those areas are no longer as cold and don't have as long a winter, the bark beetles are able to overwinter, and as a result, they're killing a lot of trees. Uh, the bristlecone pine that I'm showing here is a species that, you know, one of the oldest, in terms of individuals, organisms on the planet, these guys can live 3,000, 4,000 years, but they have no place to escape to because they live in relatively high mountains in the Sierra Nevada of California and some other nearby ranges. And if climate change continues to warm up, there won't be any place for them to go. Okay, so what, when we're talking about climate change, really what are we talking about? Well, there's whole suites of factors. The one most people are, uh, mean when they talk about climate change is an increase in temperatures. And this shows a not, the, the uh, global land and ocean temperature anomalies from January in January and Dece to December through a full year for, from 1880 to basically the present. And what you can see is in the early part of the, the late 19th century and early 20th century, we were basically coming out of what probably not very few people around today remember it, but what was called the Little Ice Age, when things were actually colder on the planet than, the, than they, they had been for a long time. And this is one of the things that really affected things like the distribution of people in North America because this period was very cold. Uh, starting around the time of the Second World War, temperatures started popping up again, but they were they, they went up, they went down, they went up, they went down till the mid-1970s. And so you can see that, that in this area here, some of the temperatures were above average, others were below average. But since the mid-1970s, you can see that there's been no years below average and a steady and persistent increase in the average temperature on a global scale. Now, it's not at a huge, the thing you have to realize is this is one degree. But on a global scale, one degree, and this is one degree Celsius, not Fahrenheit, uh, it actually can have a huge impact on a lot of areas. And what we're starting to see is that this is accelerating. Because through the, until about 1990, there were increases in the temperature, but they weren't that high. But once we've hit the late 90s and the 21st century, you can see that the temperatures have been consistently much higher on a global scale. Okay, my research career as a scientist began right about here. And so during my entire research career, I've been basically looking at nothing but increasing temperatures, although I did see a couple of years that were cooler than average during, during the early stages of my research. But during my career, our planet has gotten steadily warmer. Now, when we say steadily warmer, that does not mean warmer every place. One of the tricks that a lot of climate change deniers is they'll point out an unusual blizzard or an ice storm or something and say, oh, well, look, you know, if the, if the planet's getting warmer, why is there a blizzard in area X? Well, the point is, is that when climate starts to change, not only does it have a tendency to move in one direction, but it also tends to oscillate a lot. And that's not shown in this particular situation. Like the uh, number of hurricanes we had this, sum this last fall summer and fall may or may not be related to overall changes in planetary climate, but the intensity, that the, key, the issue here is that the number of those storms and their intensity was related to the fact that the oceans are much warmer. And the warmer the ocean is, the more intense the hurricanes will be. Because that's, that's what produces the extreme lows and it causes very tight cycling. Okay, so when you're looking on a global scale, there are basically two areas where organisms cannot escape from. And this is true of animals as well as plants. There are two basic habitats in which organisms 
cannot escape as the intensity of uh, climate change increases. The first of these is mountaintops. If a species is well adapted to living on a mountain at a, at a certain elevation, it can go up that mountain if the temperature warms, but it can't get, once it gets to the top of the mountain, it can't get any higher. The other is the polar zones, because the polar zones are also sort of an extreme in terms of, of cold, and organisms are well adapted to living with ice and snow, but if they uh, are encountering a, a change in that, in those, those conditions, there's no place colder for them to retreat to. And this is, this is a huge issue in terms of extinction. And this is one of the reasons why, I, as an example of what's going on, I want to concentrate on looking at polar zones tonight in terms of talking about the extinctions that I think are a possibility of us actually being able to experience during our lifetimes. All right, where you see climate change and habitat loss, remember what I said, habitat loss is one of the most extreme or most important areas of what leads to extinction in organisms. And when an organisms lose their habitat to climate, that's when they're really in serious trouble. So one area of the world where climate change is having major impacts that could lead to its extinctions is the Arctic. And the thing about the Arctic as opposed to the Antarctic, the Arctic is an open basin. This is all, you know, ice over water. You can see this is northern Canada here, this is Greenland, this is Siberia, this is Alaska, here's, here's more of Siberia. And you can see in 1984, when the climate change really started taking foot, this is where ice was, uh, would be found uh, in, throughout the Arctic region. In 2012, this is where it is today. You can see it's almost completely vanished from Siberia. It's also pretty much vanished from Alaska. It's still hanging on in areas of northern Canada and northern Greenland, but it's pretty much gone from this area, which really, when you think about it, it makes up about half of the world at that latitude. So that the free-floating sea ice, and this is a key thing, sea ice does not increase sea level. It's not going to increase the level of the ocean because for the same reason that if you drop an ice cube in your glass, it doesn't raise the level that much. I, you, you, can drop, you can drop ice in your ice in your glass and it floats. And it's the same thing. As long as the ice is floating, it's, when it melts, it's not going to increase sea level. The real issue that, that people are concerned about is if Greenland and Antarctica start melting, that's where, because that is glacial ice on top of land masses, that is what will lead to sea level change. Uh, basically, my, my feeling with regard to all this is uh, Miami and New Orleans are basically a write-offs. Within our lifetimes, we may find those two cities, American cities, become uninhabitable. There are a lot of other places. The, the country of Bangladesh is at great risk because a great deal of it is just barely above sea level. And so one of the things that, that some of my colleagues at KU joke about is that, you know, there's a thing about Kansas. You know, Kansas Department of Oceanography, bring, bring back the inland sea. Because during the Cretaceous period, Kansas was an ocean. A very shallow ocean, or basically a sea, really. But, but it was salt water all the way up to the Canadian border. And that's why our state fossil is a marine reptile. If you go to the KU Natural History Museum and you walk in the door, look up. There's a very, one of the world's largest lizards that ever lived is hanging above your head. And he was an aquatic creature that lived during the Cretaceous in Kansas. So, now, when we're looking at the Arctic, there's several layers going on to what's happening with sea ice. One is that there are a lot of invertebrates and species of algae which actually live on or in ice. We're not sure exactly what will happen to them if the ice melts, but the, the suspicion is it probably won't be good. The key thing also from, from our point of view, especially with regards to megafauna, is there are at least seven species of marine mammals that are heavily dependent upon ice as a habitat. 
And when you're talking about ice as a habitat, then you've, then you've got to worry. It, remember what I said, habitat loss is actually probably the major factor in extinctions. When you lose this as habitat, what does it do to the species that live there? Do they all crowd into here or do they die off? Well, that depends upon the individual species and their numbers and the, the overall conditions they're faced with. This is a model that uh, one of my colleagues in Alaska developed. And I'm, don't worry about this, I'm not going to cover this in incredible detail, but I want you to see the species here. There are four species which are called ice obligate. That means they have to have ice to live. Polar bears, walrus, bearded seals, and ring seals. There are also another group of seven, four seals and three whales that are ice associated species. And the three whales are also considered in the, in the species that, that really depended upon the ice to some degree, the beluga, the narwhal, and the bowhead whale. But there's also four other species of seals which depend upon pack ice. And then there are a number of species that are seasonally migrant that normally don't go into ice, like fin whales, minke whales, humpback whales, gray whales, and killer whales. They're all whales. But the, uh, the, the interesting situation is, is that as ice disappears, they're now invading the Arctic. And so you have this very weird situation where some species are in serious trouble because of loss of ice. Other species are actually benefiting because they're getting new habitat and new range to expand into. All right, let me give you a brief overview of these guys and what's going on with them. All right. To my mind, and I think a lot of other people are feeling basically the same way, that polar bears are the most vulnerable of the Arctic marine mammals. They're not very good swimmers. Polar bears are basically really sophisticated doggy paddlers <laughs> when it comes to swimming. They must have a ice as a habitat on which they can wander and hunt during the winter, and they spend the entire winter wandering around on the ice. They can swim if they have to, but they usually it's only good for short distances. A, a polar bear that has to swim a long distance is a polar bear in trouble. They're specialized hunters of seals, and they don't really seem to be very good at many other types of hunting, other than getting, but they're very, very good at taking some of the seals that live in the Arctic. Now, one of the things that's really interesting, and you need to keep this in mind in terms of what I was talking to you guys about earlier with the ducks and the wolves, is that Polar bears could be rescued by hybridizing with grizzly bears, which are adapted. Grizzly bears are generalized predators on land. And we've been finding a uh, large number, not a large number, but enough to, to make us uh, curious of what people are calling, much to my personal distress, pizzly bears, <laughs> which, seem, which seem to be hybrids between polar bears and Grizzly bears. I, I would actually prefer a growler myself. <laughs> the pizzly, pizzly is, is a way of insulting them as far as I'm concerned. But the irony is, is that polar bears are not really a very well adapted marine mammal. They're the most recent marine mammal to adapt. As a species, they may be maybe less than half a million years old, and they're certainly less than a million years old as a species. They did not exist until the last ice age. So they are basically a terrestrial animal that knows how to swim a little bit. And so to them, ice is completely essential because it's the substrate upon which they do most of their hunting and which they live. When they come ashore in summer, like in places like, most of you have probably seen some footage at least of them in Churchill, Manitoba, and places like that, where they hang around the garbage dumps and they wander into town and you know, they, they, they ride those giant buggies out there with the wheels that are this high to, to, so that people can take pictures of them and all. They're basically fasting during a lot of that time because the weather's relatively warm. They have a lot of fat. Uh, they, they're not feeding. What they're doing is waiting for the ice to come back in because the, uh, the ice in Hudson Bay melts out of Hudson's Bay in the summertime and then comes back in normally in the fall. The problem is, is, is it's not coming back in now. And that's what, what's leading to the problem, because the polar bears have to either stay on land or swim. And some female polar bears, like I said, are, are uh, it's sort of, they've caught on to the idea that, uh, you know, I know he's not my kind, but at least I can have kids that will survive with him with, when, when they encounter a grizzly bear. Grizzly bears, because of climate change, are also moving further north into 
polar regions where they didn't used to be found. So the, the, the real issue here is that polar bears are very vulnerable when ice disappears. What's going to happen to them? Well, the odds are that they are the marine mammal species that's most likely to go extinct. Uh, or, or the mammal species, the large megafaunal species that's most likely to go extinct as a result of climate change. This is the one species that I think is really seriously in trouble because of climate change. And they might, they, we might well lose them. Now the question is, will we really lose them or will they, their genes disappear into animals that are sort of a grizzly bear and sort of a polar bear for the next 100 or 200 years and maybe if the climate changes back in some way or, you know, God knows what, what sort of situation prevails and we end up with, with some colder conditions, then there could be selection again for polar bears and they could reappear the same way the black duck is done in New England. Okay, another species which is really dependent upon ice is the ring seal. Ring seals are the smallest species of seal. They're only about maybe a meter long, maybe four feet, and they weigh only you know 100 pounds or less. I think of a, maybe a big male might weigh 150. They're, they're smaller than humans are. They are the predominantly predominant food species of polar bears, but they're specialized to breeding and living around what is called land fast ice. Land fast ice is ice which is attached to the land and gets fairly thick when the land, because one of the things you need to keep in mind, and this is, this is always a conundrum for people to think about, when you're talking about what are the coldest places on earth, it's the middle of continents, not ocean. Oceans, because there's water, and water can get below freezing, but not much below freezing, and then if it does, then it gets a nice layer of insulating ice over the top of it, the, you know, you can get to minus 40 or 50 in the air on land or on ice, but when you're in the water, it's not, you're not going to get much below freezing. In fact, usually right at freezing. This is why a lot of these species live in the uh, Arctic and Antarctic oceans during the winter, because the, the water is warmer for them than, the, than being out of the water would be. And people don't think in these terms, but if their habitat disappears, and since these guys are specialized to the land fast ice, this is now starting to disappear or form unusually late in the winter time. And ring seals give birth on in layers under the snow on the ice. And their pups are cared for for several weeks while they stay in these layers or dens. Okay, ring seals are the primary prey of both polar bears and the indigenous Inuit peoples in Canada. And so they are a very important food source. And initially, they might.